okay, one of these days I need to have another human in this room so that someone else can help me with the like, the framing and the microphones and everything. Cause it'd be so much easier with another human. Anyways, hi. <laughs> So today we're going to be talking about this delightful clip from Miss Mabel Lee, The Chicken Shack Shuffle from 1943. It rhymes. And the reason we're talking about it is because Mike and I were having a chat about this clip a while ago and I wanted to be like, why is it a chicken shack? Why is she dancing in a chicken shack? Also, what is a soundie? Like really, what is a soundie? Because I have a vague idea of what a soundie is. Like people have told me it's like a music video before they were music videos, but I don't actually have a very, before the research, I didn't really have a very realistic idea of how were they shown, where were they shown, breaking down what actually is a soundie, why is she singing about a chicken shack, and also a little bit more about how this kind of came to be. Little bits and pieces, it's not a full full like breakdown of the clip or anything, but some interesting context that I found around the clip and around the concept of soundies. When you hear this idea that soundies were MTV before there was MTV, they're not entirely wrong, but they're also not entirely accurate. If you went to a bar, a club, a restaurant, anywhere there's a lot of people gathering in a social way, in a way that you can't do now because of coronavirus, there is potentially a machine in the corner called a panoram. Panorams were produced by a company called Globe Mills Productions. It was a collaboration between Mills and Novelty Company, America's largest producer of jukebox in 1940, and James Roosevelt, who was, in fact, Roosevelt the president's child. So these two people came together in an attempt to make a new kind of jukebox, but for film instead of music. These soundies would be like a short three minute, three to four minute like little musical performance, probably filmed just in a single day. And the music would all be pre-recorded and the artist would be lip syncing or miming along with the pre-recorded track. Let's say you're a bar manager, you have a bar, you would like to have a panoram in your bar. What you would get is you get the panorama and it would come with eight to nine soundies per reel. You could install the reel into the panorama and when your customers came by, they'd put a dime into the panorama and it would play projecting onto a back wall behind the machine, the soundies. So you'd often watch like these short clips back to back with no change between them. It would just roll from one to another and you wouldn't really get to pick which one you'd watch. You just watch the whole reel kind of dealy. A soundy reel might include something like a cheesecake segment, which was a strip tease or a burlesque or something a bit saucy, specifically intended to attract wartime soldiers on leave. There was also other soundies that were specifically very patriotic about when Hitler kicked the bucket or the white cliffs of Dover, which uh, were again specifically kind of targeting this audience of soldiers on wartime leave. You would change out the reels in your panoramas probably about weekly. The Soundies Distribution Corporation of America would provide new Soundy reels within about a couple weeks of filming. It took a quite quick time to put it all together. And so it means that there was a very rapid turnover of having new material shown to the public very quickly. Other people you might see featured on the Soundies include the International Sweethearts of Rhythm, Lucky Melinda, Earl Hines, Joe Marsala, Louis Jordan, George Kirby, Maxine Sullivan, Bill Bojangles Robson, Skeets Tobert, the list goes on and on and on. This was a relatively easy way for a variety of artists to get a larger exposure to the general public without being featured on the silver screen, and it often had a much lower bar to entry. Another important thing to know about Soundies is they didn't fall under the Hayes Code. The Hayes Code ran from 1934 to 1968, and it was a series of puritanical, very moral, guidelines and regulations that people making movies had to abide to. Basically saying that women can't be showing too much skin, you can't show too much alcohol consumption or sex or violence. And so there was a lot of like puritanical beliefs about what the general public should or should not be allowed to be witness to. Um, and that's what the Hayes Code was basically about. But Soundies didn't, didn't matter, which is why Mabel Lee is wearing a very scantily clad outfit because it wasn't under the Hayes Code so she could wear very little clothing. Okay, soundies, we know what they are. They are short movies, they're played on a loop with a bunch of other movies in random public spaces like amusement parks, nightclubs, bars, restaurants. Amusement lounges is another phrase I heard where you might find a panorama. But let's go into the chicken shack side of things because why is she singing about chicken shack? Then in the background you can see it has a sign saying Southern Fried Chicken uh, for 35 cents. You can also see a very patriotic poster which again, Remember, this is about the wartime appealing to soldiers on leave, so it makes sense that there would be like patriotic messaging in the background. But what's with the chicken? Why, why chicken? I found out this song and this whole thing is based off a real location, a real place in Harlem. Stay with me. I wanna tell you the tale 
of Tilly Fripp. Now, Miss Tilly Fripp came from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and she came up to Harlem, uh, ostensibly as far as I can tell, for a holiday, for a vacation, just to visit, with just $1.98 in her pocket. And she started working in, as a cook in a random speakeasy. The speakeasy, I cannot find out its name. I can find out where it was. It was between West 33rd Street and Lenox Avenue. It was a relatively quiet part of Harlem, but Miss Tilly Fripp was a bomb ass cook. <laughs> between the fact that she was um, just a really genuinely kind person and she treated everyone who walked through her door the same and was very kind and very open to everyone, and the fact that she would have amazing platters, like not just like a little bit of chicken, whatever. She would have ham and eggs and chicken and waffles and everyone loved her. So loads of people would come by all the time. There was lines down the block. People would pull up in their cars around the alleyway at the back and just like, yo Tilly, can I get some food? Because it was a speakeasy, musicians would come and jam there as well. I read this, I don't know how true it is because it was in a blog post and not an academic article or interview, but there is stories about the fact that this was one of the few places in Harlem where white musicians and black musicians would jam together so white musicians could learn the ways of jazz. I, um, I think it sounds too good to be true personally, but mm. this speakeasy, because of Tilly, became one of the spots for like a late night snack after you've been dancing or going to the jazz clubs. And soon enough, she was able to open her own place. So she moved just next door at 48th West and 33rd Street, and she called it Tilly's Chicken Shack. And so she had her own venue, and she just continued selling chicken to the masses. So for those of you who are like me and maybe don't have a really great understanding of American geography slash how the culture of geography intersect, I had a quick chat with Shelby L. Johnson about Philadelphia. I wanted to understand why a Philly Fripp coming from Philadelphia meant that she could cook amazing fried chicken. I wasn't quite sure of that correlation. And so to quote Mr. Shelby, Philly is one of the most densely populated black cities in America. It's probably the most black populated Northern city and has a rich history regarding black culture. A lot of black people migrated there from the South. So her coming from Philadelphia is actually super interesting to this idea of moving to Harlem. She moved from one very densely populated black city where they had a lot of like culture for having great Southern food to Harlem to continue that tradition going. So it is important. And I thought that was a, like a relevant little contextual cue for someone like me, maybe who doesn't know a lot about different cities in America interact with each other in terms of like where kind of the pockets of black culture were. You also have Detroit and Michigan as well, which is also a very densely populated black center in the North. But anyways, we're getting off track again, but basically it was a real chicken shop. It was run by a woman from Philadelphia and it was one of the places where jazz musicians would get together and jam late night um, as they ate lots of delicious food. And I'll, you know, I just, I'm here for delicious food and I'm here for music and delicious food being in the same place. I am, that is just so dope to me. I'm so here for that. In case you're wondering, this outfit that Miss Mabel Lee is wearing is recycled. It was actually worn originally by Pauline Bryant in a clip called Jungle Jamboree. As far as I can tell, it was worn first by Pauline Bryant and then Miss Mabel Lee wore it. The original clip, Jungle Jamboree, is like the dancing is good and like some elements of it are very interesting, but it is super jungle fever, cringy. Like I just, uh, it's really hard to watch it because it, it's so fetishizing of black culture and I just, mm, yeah. So at the beginning of the clip, we get this little title card which says Storyville Films presents Mabel Lee Chicken Shack Shuffle. There is no information about who else is featured in this clip. Also, who directed and produced the clip. Well, every time I look up Storyville Films, I get this modern British company, which is not particularly useful. However, based on the fact that he produced the majority of Mabel Lee's soundies at the time, we can probably assume that it was produced or directed by William Forrest Crouch. He produced many other soundies at the time, and he would probably have thought himself to be the person who discovered Miss Mabel Lee. By this point, Mabel was already working in Harlem as a chorus line dancer at the Apollo Theater. Bud Pollard, who was an agent working in Harlem at the time, found her and introduced her to William Forrest Crouch, who then put her in a bunch of soundies. The other people who aren't uncredited in this piece who I managed to find the names of is the pianist who played the song, Dan Burley. The thing that I couldn't find out was who these wonderful dancers are at the end. My research has shown that they were probably part of the Whitey's Lindy Hoppers, and I also don't know who this hilarious and beautifully comical tap dancer is either. So if any of you guys have any idea of who these people are, please, 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 please let me know because I'm super curious and I couldn't find anything and I would love to know if anyone else has secret sources of information that I do not have. But hopefully this was a useful video for you. It was like a little bit more context 
on soundies, why they're in a chicken shop, and a little bit of other bits and pieces that maybe is useful for you as well. Just an FYI, this is probably gonna be my last video before the holiday season, just because I would like to have a break from thinking about what video I need to make every week, every other week. What? I have a, basically I have this like running guilt if I don't make a video in a while, and I would like that to shh for the holidays, if at all possible. Please do leave a comment uh, letting me know what kind of content you would like to see from me in the future, because I'll be starting up again in the new year. So let me know if there's anything in particular you would like to know more about, get a bit more research done. I feel like such a dweeb saying this, but it legitimately makes me feel amazing and it legitimately like, encourages me to keep doing this content. So if you could consider liking and subscribing, that would mean a whole lot to me. So. It genuinely makes me feel better if I see people have commented or like, I specifically love when people comment. It just motivates me to do this more. So like, you know, it'd be cool if you did that or whatever. Anyways, I hope we have a lovely holiday season celebrating however you can safely uh, and whatever you want to celebrate. I will see you all in the new year and I hope everything is slightly better. I cannot wait for 2020 to be over. I don't think 2021 is gonna be better, but I just want 2020 to be over. Okay, thanks, bye. It was just a puritanical code to make sure that the general public were not sullied by the horrors of the internet. Internet? Of the media, of movies. Was that a Freudian slip?